I think so. Okay. Now right. we're live. Right. Um, yeah, it looks like we got everyone. I believe so. Yeah. Nice. All right. Um, good morning. <laughs> good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. Welcome everyone who has been with us since the beginning and new students and people that are tuning in for another episode of TM 101. This is episode number 65. Um, if you have not changed your chat settings, please make sure to change it to all panelists and attendees. That helps us address all your questions in the chat room. Also, if you have yet to follow and subscribe, follow us on our YouTube channel. All of our previous webinars are there for you to go back and review any other lessons that we've already covered. And it keeps you updated for all our future uh, webinars coming up. Today, we're going to be talking advanced international touring. I'm going to pass it over to MJ to get some intros started and uh, we'll get this thing kicked off. Great. Thank you, Mark. Um... We've got a lot to cover, so I'll keep this quick. So on our first couple panels about international touring, we covered things like visas and travel and gear and carnets, which are all very important. But in our advanced international touring, what we're calling advanced international touring, we are going to touch base with um, three reps from some of our favorite countries to tour in, um, Japan, the UK, and Australia, to hear what it's like on the ground and what the touring culture is like. Because when you get there, that's what's going to help you navigate um, being in those countries. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand it off to Mark to get to know our guests. Hey, great. Um, so we're going to kick it off with some light intros. I'm going to start with Rob and we'll work our way around and then we'll <clears throat> get the conversation started. How's it going, Rob? Well, nice to meet everyone. Nice to see everyone. Thank you for having me. My name is Rob Kelso. I am a promoter rep for the company Creative Man Productions Japan. I have been with them for about 28 years. Um, we're a little bit unique in that I'm based in Los Angeles, and we also have a rep in London that does my job as well. Um, a lot of international, a lot of uh, promoters in other countries don't often have a local rep, so we're a little bit unique in that. Um, what else can I answer for you? Uh, one second. Um, I think that covers a pretty, pretty good spread. Uh, covered company title, how long you've been doing it, background. Uh, what are you up to now? Uh, right now, we're still planning on touring next year. We've got festivals coming up and we're looking for a positive future. Nice. Um, Kara, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Great. Tell us a little bit about yourself. So um, I work for SGM Concerts as a promoter rep in the UK. Um, I've been doing it for over 15 years. I'm not quite sure how long. It just feels a long time. Um, and uh, how I came into it, um, I don't know, I guess my dad was in a band. He was in Herman's Hermits. They toured this, uh, the world in the 60s. And when I was born, after the 60s, because I'm not that old, um, <laughs> I sort of, we, we went on tour as, as a family with the, with the band and latterly sold merch to them and advanced stuff from, for them like, towards the end of the 80s and the 90s. So learned a lot about touring etiquette back then, when to be seen, when not to be seen, when to keep away, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, then I worked in a venue called The Roadhouse in Manchester, which is a little old rock club that um, sadly is no longer there. Um, and I was in bands as well. And a lot of the people that were in the venue were, were in bands too. And I think because it was known as a toilet tour, it was all the shitholes of Britain. Um, and it was one of the main ones on that tour. We do, we'd, we'd ca we cared a lot about the gig. We cared a lot about the, venue, the bands coming through. We'd put a lot of love into it. You know, it might be a Victorian downstairs basement venue and looks a bit grotty, but you know what, we loved it and we gave a great vibe and generally people went away loving it and that's really where I cut my teeth about and I became a promoter there, which I hated and I was really bad at um, and then became a promoter rep because I preferred doing, dealing with the nuts and bolts of it all rather than pretending that I knew who was going to make the money. So That's great. Uh, what, uh, what are you doing now? I'm promoting, well, at the moment, not a lot, but um, <laughs> I'm still promoter repping and 
do artist liaison, we do different jobs on site for outdoor events and outdoor shows and festivals and stuff. That's great. Um, and Kara, how are you doing? Tell us a little bit about your story. Uh, not, not Kara, I'm so sorry. Alice, <laughs> how are you doing? <laughs> I'm I looking like, at all well, the I'm looking at all the tiles and I'm looking over and then well, I'm like Kara's right next to you. I'm so sorry. Well, to be honest, I was like, wow, my 4:30 a.m. brain is like, hold on, whoa, did I just mishear that? Yes, <laughs> um, Alice yeah, is I'm live in Australia. <laughs> um, look, thanks so much for having me, and yeah, I too am really excited for today. So. Yeah, my name's Alice. I am currently based out of a city called Adelaide, um, which is in the south in Australia. Uh, I work as a tour manager and production coordinator. Um, I've travelled a lot around the world, but I really sunk my teeth into the touring circuit when I became an artist liaison for a touring festival here in Australia called St. Jerome's Laneway Festival. Uh, and basically, I kind of wear the hat of artist liaison, yeah, and then work across production coordination and TMing and I guess yeah I'm kind of um, one of the lucky ones that I am in a city where I've been able to continue to work and so I've been able to sort of do some COVID safe touring here in Australia and then also an currently be an associate producer for a major city festival that's happening here uh, in about three weeks time. That's great um, and well to keep the conversation going I'm going to pass it over. Who is taking it from right now? Sorry about that. My screen is a little squanched right now. I'm going to pass it over to 5-1 to talk with Rob. Adrian, actually. Ad Adrian. Adrian's picking it up next. <laughs> All right. Oh, we're having mm -hmm. some, uh, we're having some issues here. Technical issues. How are we now? Can you hear yeah, me? Yeah, perfect. Can you hear me? We're here. Yes. Let's there we go. It. It's a day. It's okay. that day. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Morning. Testing. One, two. Check, check. Mic check. Thank you. It worked a minute ago. Hi, Rob. Hello. We're so stoked to have you today. Thank you for joining us. Um, Thank you for having me. Yeah, for sure. Uh, for those who are new to touring, Creative Man is pretty much the lead welcoming promoter in Japan doing the summer stonic festivals and the sprinklings and things like that. And Rob is kind of the, the, the glue, the, the glue for U.S. acts to come over. And we're talking about cultural, um, cultural touring etiquette a little bit today. And Japan is really such a different culture than than the US and everything is done just so differently. So we're really honored to have you as one of the premier guys to bridge that gap. We've done lots of stuff together over the years and it's always just so interesting. And thank you again for helping me to um, understand that we don't scan tickets and I'm never gonna get a manifest. No matter <laughs> no matter how long, how, how much I wanted to get manifest in Japan, I'm never gonna get one. Um, Okay, so let's start out, Rob, if you're a, a new, newer act, club right. level act that's just coming to Japan for the first time. Let's um, talk about what the smaller acts can expect on their first jaunt over. Well, the, the smaller acts are usually hosted by either the label or possibly a publisher. Um, there's someone who's sponsoring the tour because it's just not uh, cost effective to bring over a really small club act without some sort of financial backing. Um, usually when you have this, you the label is uh, organizing a great deal of press to get as much exposure to your release as they possibly can. So uh, you're gonna fly into either, you're gonna fly into either Tokyo or Osaka. Um, each city has two airports. Uh, Narita in Tokyo is several hours away from Tokyo Central and Haneda is much closer. In uh, Osaka is a similar situation. Uh, Kansai is very far away and Itami is, is much closer, but it really comes down to, you know, you're an early band, what's the cheapest ticket you can get? And uh, so once you arrive in to Japan, you go through customs, you'll have a, a visa of course to get stamped. And then you'll meet our reps on the other side of the gates to, to customs. Uh, then likely you will uh, walk to a van or series of vans, which will take you into Tokyo 
Central or Osaka Central, depending on which city you've landed in. Um, you'll go to the hotel. The band party will check in and go to the room. The crew party will drop their luggage and come down to a production meeting. Um, we have a production meeting as soon as you arrive. Uh, I've never not. Have, I've never not done it that way. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, uh, the production meeting will either be in the hotel restaurant or it'll be in a ballroom, depending on the size of the number of people. Uh, you will be met there with three or four people from our company, as well as uh, department heads from each of the departments. So there will most likely be a rep from the lighting company, a rep from the sound company, a stage manager, uh, pyro, if that's something that's coming in. Um, you'll have a meeting, they'll go through the entire tour, light plots, load in times, everything. Uh, once that's settled, uh, usually the crew out and get some dinner or something. The next morning is an early call. Uh, I, I want to um, yeah. just cross-reference something real quick. Sure. Those department heads, not only are they there to organize each department's production responsibilities, but they have a certain responsibility to the officials in the city as well. Can you explain that just briefly? So that Absolutely. Folks, hmm? So uh, if there were to be a fire or an earthquake or, or some sort of problem during the show, um, the Japanese police or the fire marshal has to be able to talk to each department head. So there is a local person in each department head to deal with that situation if there is a problem. The way there's not a translator, there's not a communication problem, it is just that person is going to jump in and take over your light board if that needs to happen. It's never happened in my situation, but it is there for that reason. Um, it's just it just speaks to the level of efficiency that the Japanese put in in place. They you know and they, safety yeah yep yeah, so efficiency and safety is paramount. Thank you. So uh, then the next morning you'll you'll go to load in uh, the crew will go to load in and, uh, meet your rental gear um, whatever backline I'm sure there'll be changes they'll run out and deal with that. Uh, band will show up at noon one do a sound check. Doors are quite early. They'll be four or five o'clock. Show is early, probably five, six, hour and a half. Well, and why are, why are shows typically so early? The shows are early because uh, you have to get the audience back. Most people take public transportation, specifically trains. Trains end at midnight. That means you've got to get all the way home before the trains stop. Most people don't do a lot of drinking or partying before a show they do it all after the show and they want to get home or closer to home to their local izakaya or local bar and drink there before going home so shows are always early if you're talking about arena show or a stadium show they're even earlier and uh, if it's a weekend you may be headlining at 3 4 p.m absolutely this is true mm -hmm. so after the show you load out, uh, that'll go faster than you can imagine. And then uh, usually the whole party is taken back to the hotel where they go out and enjoy the night of the city. Uh, the next morning, you'll get up fairly early. There'll be an early train for the crew, probably a later one for the band party. If it's a, it's a small tour, it's the first tour, you're probably traveling together and you're gonna go straight to the next venue. You're gonna load in. You're going to do your show and then you're going to go to the hotel at, at night. You're there's no way to take luggage on the bullet train. So you're going to drop your luggage at the hotel and a truck is going to take it to the next city, which you will then find it either at the venue or uh, the next hotel, depending on what you've decided with the production meeting the day before. Right. And so you always want to let your folks know that you grab a, Pack an overnighter. Um, Mary Jo, did you want to? I, I have a feeling you I was, wanted to say yeah, something. Yeah, somebody about actually somebody Colette. actually said it. David Davidian actually said it in the chat as well. Yeah. I said yesterday, yeah. the first time I was in Japan, mm -hmm. it throws you so hard because they say leave your luggage outside the door after the show. And if you're coming from the US or the UK, anywhere basically in the world that you would, if you stuck your luggage outside your door, it would be stolen. It really throws you the first time you're like, no. And they're like, no, that's fine. And mm -hmm. then, yeah, you just leave it there. Nobody touches it. And then it magically gets taken away and reappears 
outside your door at the next hotel. <laughs> yeah, it does. It's really it does. crazy at first, though. You really have to think that through. <laughs> And trust. I, I, you know, and that, and yes, I was just going to say, and trust you as, as a, as a U.S. touring entity that comes over to Japan, if you're going in for the first time, you're asked to trust your partners because they take everything for you. You're, you're just there to make sure that your party is getting what it needs and you kind of have to let go and yeah. relax into the customs and understand that they know what they're doing. The, the, you know, and again, let's let's move on to the next segment of, about how the Japanese tend to do things. For me, um, let's talk about ticketing because that was yeah. that was one that where where what I couldn't understand was how the Japanese, who were absolutely the most efficient culture, I think, you know, as far as technology and 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 innovative science and things like that, and they can't get it. They're not scanning tickets, and there's no manifest. And that's to me that lack of tracking was hard to wrap my head around. So let's get into that a little bit, Rob. Okay, uh, <laughs> in America and most other countries, there's one or possibly two or three different ticket companies. Japan has like 27, and there's four or five major ones. The four or five major ones are mostly owned by convenience stores. Uh, there is no printed home tickets. You go and buy your tickets online and they're either mailed to you or you go into a convenience store and print them out at a kiosk type machine. And sometimes you go and reserve them and then go to the convenience store and pay for them and get your tickets. So when day of show, you've got five, six, seven different ticket stocks uh, in America, that would never, you'd never have that case. You'd always have a Ticketmaster ticket that looked exactly the same as every single one. Um, and they don't scan tickets. It's still ripped tickets. Um, the Deadwood, Deadwood ticket, for days. Yeah, the ticket reports are, uh, they come weekly to our company. And then we put them together and send them to you. So that uh, there's no way for me to log on on a Monday, say, and get exactly the ticket reports. So as many times I get angry emails from agents' assistants demanding ticket reports on a Monday, I can't get them to until Wednesday because that's when I get them. So. Hey, Rob, um, can you also talk about fan club and VIP meet and greets? Sure. Um, VIP meet and greets, especially paid ones, uh, can be a, a real uh, problem, uh, mostly because uh, you're straddling two different issues. One is that in, in most places, paid upgrades or, or, or VIP meet and greets are kind of a slush fund where you can just kind of pocket the money and you're not really sharing anybody, you're not telling anybody. With. But in Japan, if the immigration department finds that you're doing, you're earning money somewhere else that isn't part of your visa process, you're going to get in a lot of trouble and have trouble getting into the country again. The second aspect is, okay, I'm not going to do those meet and greets at a different place, or I'm going to do them in conjunction with the show. Well, then PRS, JASRAC, the PRS society, will then change your, your fees on that show to reflect the different ticket prices. So each upgrade, each package plus ticket becomes a different ticket package. And the way they calculate the the PRS fee is not based on average of ticket prices or, or a, a percentage of gross. It is an average of ticket prices times the number of tickets available. So if you were to add, say, one ticket at $10,000, let's say you had the golden ticket and you got to play guitar with the band on for that ticket, your PRS fees would now go up more than you've grossed for the show just because of the way the math works. So it's not financially worth it to do paid VIP meet and greets unless you are doing so many of them that it brings the, the average down. Interesting. So one next topic, Rob, is here in the States, we are so used to touring using tour buses and fly dates. When you're 
Traveling and moving around in Japan, especially on festivals, can you tell us the differences between traveling on a bullet train and doing flights? Sure. So most solo tours, most just one band tour, one, two band tours, you're going to be taking trains because it's slightly more efficient um, because you don't have to get to the airport early. You don't have to get all the way to the airport in the cities. You can travel from central city to central city. But you can't take luggage or gear on the train. So if you have a festival, then we, we people fly because you fly to Tokyo, Osaka, Osaka to Tokyo, because then you can take your luggage and your gear with you and it travels with you. Yeah. On individual dates, then it's either riding in the luggage truck or depending on where the venue and the hotel is, space at the end of the gear truck. Does that answer your question? Um, and I just wanted to pose this question to my colleagues, actually. This, we've, we're talking specifically Japan here, but, um, you know, are, are your experiences in other Southeast Asian markets that are normally toured, let's say, South Korea or China, are those similar to Japan? I don't think anybody does it to the detail, level of detail that Japan does. I mean, just like nobody. I think, I think uh, Tokyo <laughs> and just Japan in general is one of a kind I, experience. I, often, I agree with my colleagues. I think, you know, you go into different places in Asia, some of the customs appear to be similar, but the efficiency and the attention to detail and also the manner of the Japanese, the manner of the Japanese. Yeah is something that comes out, you know, the way that they handle um, protocols and cultures, they're very formal, they're extremely polite. And, and, that, and that's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting dichotomy between Americans and Japanese and the way we do things, yeah. for sure. I think Korea is very organized, like the dates I've done in Korea, very organized, you know, but there's just an extra layer and it's definitely cultural, you know, in Japan, it's just this extra and I love it. Oh my God. If you're like, if you like numbers and logistics and spreadsheets and Gantt charts, you're just going to want to go to Japan because it's, it's the best. Um, I, I wanted to ask Rob something that you may not know the first time that you go um, to Japan is some little cultural things like in the business meeting, you may get handed business cards. And as an American, you might just go boop, look at it and stick it in your pocket. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's a whole kind of ritual to that. And same with gift yes. giving. Can you talk a little bit about that and what people okay. in touring can expect? Um, well, I mean, the music business and the touring business is certainly more relaxed in this issue than say, you know, the banking industry or, or something like that. But uh, yeah, business cards are very important. Um, and looking at the business card you've received is very important and not just putting it in your pocket, you know, have it, put it on the table till the end of the meeting. Um, if you're going to be completely correctly polite, then you should read it out loud. But a lot of those names are really hard to pronounce and that's fine. No one's going to fault you for not doing that. Um, gifts um, depends on the tour, uh, but it's very polite to bring a small gift either from the country that you're coming from or from your home country, if, if you can, but certainly just like a box of candy or something, not, nothing expensive or, or just a, a thoughtful gift for, if you think that the people have really helped you in your advances, and that's a really nice thing to do. And there's a question actually in the chat from Madison asking, do you have issues with fans creating or mimicking tickets if they aren't scanned? Mm. I wouldn't say we have a big problem with that. That has happened, but it's not a, uh, since no one prints home tickets, there's no PDF tickets, they would actually have to get a ticket and reproduce it with the cardboard stock paper, which would be extremely hard to get. Plus I'm guessing that it's just maybe not as much of a cultural thing <laughs> like <laughs> to try that. Or maybe it is. I don't know. Um, Jim, I thought, were you, did you have something, Jim, to add? I thought I saw you. I was just going to say in China, I mean, that's this, it's similar that you've got to be prepared for, that's a whole other world. When you go to, go to China, there's some corruption. You got to be able to deal with, deal with that. And you know, all the things that come with that. It. It's definitely an apples to oranges yeah. scenario. Like if you're going to Vietnam and you're going to Bangkok and you're going to Myanmar, 
they're, they're just different beasts within their own right. Um, even China to Japan are, are significantly different in, in ways. So just yeah. adding. Hey, Rob, can you there. also share with us about translators at the initial meeting and, you know, pretty much traveling with you the whole time that you're in Japan? Yeah. So uh, depending on the size of the tour party, you'll have one or two translators with you. If it's a big arena tour, there'll obviously be several more. But uh, we either provide translators from our company staff or from professional translators that are just, uh, that's their full-time independent job. Uh, they travel with you uh, anything show related. So between cities to the venues, they're not really out there to take you to dinner and, and uh, do those things, but you'll be fine without them. Uh, production translators are more experienced in obviously speaking production. We wouldn't want to give anyone, someone who didn't understand stage direction and, and what gear was without that information. All right, on to Cara. Let's talk the UK and Europe, since those are now separate um, markets for us. If you're unaware, if you've been living under a rock, the United Kingdom left the, the European Union um, on the 1st of January this year. So we are now in a situation where the UK will be um, a separate border crossing going into mainland Europe in the same way that you would go from uh, the US into Canada or European Union into Switzerland, for example. Um, none of us have actually experienced what touring in, under Brexit ha has been like yet. Um, there have definitely been some teething problems at the borders, but you know we don't really want to get into speculating about what that will look like once touring resumes. So let's, Carl, let's talk about what touring in the UK and Europe looks like or looked like when we finished up um, just under a year ago, yeah. um, because it's probably close, most closely resembles touring in the US and Canada um, for anyone who's over there. So let's say uh, first, first European tour, the band's coming in to do small clubs in the UK and maybe like couple in Northern European countries. Um, what, what's that going to look like on your end once the band arrives? Well, the, ba the band, the, you, you'll probably hire some gear from somewhere like John Henry's or another um, gear hire place. And you'll pick up your sprinter or your splitter or your, your bus and your trailer and you probably flow some stuff over with you as well. Um, and then you get on the bus and get on the... And then you get to the get to your first venue or you go into rehearsals or whatever it is that your first thing is that you're going to be doing. I don't see you at rehearsals generally. I will see you at your first show that you have with me. Um, right. Um, and and because the it's worth noting that because the distances are much smaller, especially in the UK, you know, you can go from Liverpool to Manchester to Leeds and have shows in each market and be driving for an hour. Um, particularly in your part of the world so it, it you, you do tend to find bands a bit further up the the ladder will still be using sprinter vans and hotels rather than using buses where across this side of the pond you know it's it's 10 12 hour drives often day after day after day so is that your experience you know you see theater touring bands in sprinters they can do yeah not i mean theater to once you're hitting a couple of couple of thousand, three thousand, four thousand caps, then they're generally in a bus. The smaller right. ones, your 300, 500, that sort of thing, will be in a splitter, in a sprinter, you would think. Yeah. Depending on, on the on the artist, obviously, and the, the money, but back in they've got, I guess. Yeah. I, personally, I went I was out on a tour with a a pretty well-known artist, and the crew were traveling in buses, but the the band themselves were in a sprinter, staying in nicer hotels, because they, they just didn't. They didn't like the bus life. They wanted to, you know, the drives were a couple hours max each day. So they chose to go that route. That's just important to mention that that is more possible in Europe and more widely done in Europe. Um, so um, talk to us a little bit about um, advancing the show. You know, you mentioned to us yesterday, it's quite common in the UK for um, the company to take the advancing in-house. Is that right? 
with the promoter? Yeah, for our company, yes. I don't. I think the other companies probably do do it differently. Um, a lot of the reps do advance their own shows in the other in other companies, but um, for SJM, we have a, a great advanced team at, in the office in Manchester, and that's who you do your advance with. Um, I meanwhile are jumping from show to show or tour to tour all around the country, and I get the advance generally, hopefully a week in advance. And then I'll touch base to the tour manager, production manager, whoever I need to coordinate security, whichever level we're at, and um, make sure I have things in my, in my mind ready or written down in my pad and pen, because I don't do spreadsheets for that. I just have an old school, write it all down um, and know what to expect when, when we meet for show one, you know? Yeah. And, and just to speak to, to Europe, um, it can be a little different going from the UK to, to mainland Europe. And each country has a little bit of a different way of doing it, but you will tend to find a lot more in the UK. You know, it might be the Academy venues in the UK are quite similar to the House of Blues venues in the US chain, you know, uh, pretty hard on the times, especially on, on loadout when they're flipping for a club afterwards. And you'll have a promoter rep come in for your show from the promoter. Mainland Europe, things vary a little bit more. Some some venues in some countries are really well funded and might have a separate hospitality backstage person and a separate production manager. So you're dealing with, even at small clubs, you're dealing with separate people for production and then non-production issues. Um, and, you know, a lot of European venues, they might be better set up at a smaller size to accommodate catering, um, to have showers. Some even have apartments built into the venue or attached to the venue. So if you're a small touring band on your first trip around Europe, uh, you may run into Switzerland or the Netherlands or France and, and find some really well um, equipped venues for you. The UK tends to be a lot more similar to North America, um, a lot more traditional, you know, especially in the clubs and theaters. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about Cara um, some of the challenges um, maybe the unique things about the UK as a market um, you know in terms of the venues themselves yeah I mean go, just going back to scooting back to what you said about the club nights after, after the gigs and it irritates everybody nobody likes it but it, that is keeping the vet revenue coming in to get help those clubs can exist. So we have to kind of take it on the chin and, and work with it. You know, I know it is a pain. Could you um, walk us through a, what, what a disco loadout turnaround, let's say at the Ritz in Manchester, you know, if they've got a club coming on after your show, can you walk us through what the timings might be on something like that? Did you, yeah, I would usually curfew the gig about at 10 o'clock, maybe even a bit earlier. It's all gone out on the socials. Everyone knows that the doors are at six. So, and people are really used to it now. It's, you know, it's unusual for people to not know that it was a club night on a Saturday night, say, for example, like you say at the Ritz. Um, and then what we do is we we do the, start the load out. Get, and they're very quick as well, to be honest with you, the crew there especially. Um you won't be carrying that much product production, you would hope, in somewhere like that, when you've got a club night afterwards. And then you what we'll do is that they'll they'll do, you know, it has been there. <laughs> um, and then then what you can then what we do is we just get get that moving as quickly as possible. Work work alongside the venue. The venue won't have a massive crowd coming in at that time, so they'll probably put them in the room downstairs and they'll start the club night down there and then bring him up. Once we're out and clear, we're fine with the dress keeping the dressing rooms and we're fine to keep backstage, but the room has to be has to be clear and the decks on stage and whatever else they have to have for that particular night yeah so i mean disco loadout on tour is is a your your crew will look at you disparagingly when you tell them you've got a disco loadout tonight but that's something you want to put in your in master tour as early as possible and you want it to be bold and underlined in whatever you know you want to make sure everyone's prepped going into that so you know quite often your turnaround might be as short as 30, 40 minutes, an hour to get the club up, you know? So in that time, they've got to clear the stage, get all your gear out to the truck or the bus and turn that around and start getting people in for the club. Um, can sometimes, you talk sometimes the club will throw an extra few hands at it to, from their side, which they would pay yeah. for just to make it quicker. 
to have. I'm going to say like the crews in the UK are because, like you said, Kara, it's a thing. They're um, the disco loadout are so fast. Mm. Those outs are so fast, <laughs> so remarkable to like watch. It's just like clockwork. <laughs> um, just it, the pub. <laughs> well, talking about pub and drinking, uh, can you speak to us a little bit about, you know, the, the difference in demographic in the UK, what it can be like, especially loading out on the weekend in a downtown area, like where the Ritz is at, you know, uh, it, it might come as a little bit of a culture shock uh, coming to the UK for the first time. Yeah, we can have some raucous crowds. <laughs> um, and if they're still congregating outside the venue, when when you're trying to get your load out done, obviously we'll get security and out the way uh, to keep them out of the way and it, keep it as safe as possible, of course. Um, and yeah, it's the the crowds. It, uh, crowds can be. It's, it's some some bands. Um, there's one particular band that comes to mind that um, I've worked with right from the beginning and like from the 300 caps venues right through to arenas and they had a new tour manager and he came in he was his first tour i think he'd done a couple of shows in the us and they'd done a bit of a run in the, in europe and then they were starting in the uk and he was like oh it's such a chilled vibe the audience are just so chilled they don't do anything i was like no and they do crowd surfing there's circle pits there's all sorts of throwing beer everywhere we need bisqueen on top of the on top of the desks and and he was like really i was like mm-hmm Let's just see. And it was right because I'd seen, obviously I'd seen the crowds that we'd had before. So yeah, they can get a bit raucous on a weekend. They just love music. They love live music. And if it's a particular style of band that attracts sort of a soccer fan crowd, it can get even more chaotic. That's a great point. And, and you mentioned this queen there. And Jay, maybe you want to talk about the bars quickly. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I was a, a promoter up so similar to Kara in Scotland so I only covered Scotland um in in similar um I would cover if somebody did a run actually we worked a lot we worked pretty closely with SJM so when your tours came north of the border then we would pick them up and a lot of times I was the rep on that so uh there is a venue in uh Glasgow called uh, the Barrowlands or the Barris um, which on our on our Facebook page, Doug did a lovely tribute to um, a ways back. Um, but it's it's legendary and it's amazing to see a show there. Um, but it's sort of known for certain types of shows. Not I think a lot of bands think that it happens at every single show, but it really doesn't. It's same thing. Like certain crowds throw beer, <laughs> and you know security's used to it and everything. However often for those bands, they will cover the gear with Visqueen, you know, and cover it just to make sure that like nothing goes wrong. Um, but yeah, um, that that's a thing. It's, uh, you know, but security knows how to deal with it. They expect it, but it is something that bands would be aware of. Now, another thing in, I don't know about every city in like England, but I definitely know in Scotland and definitely in Glasgow, um, if, and especially the Bears, but certain other venues uh if you have crew t-shirts you have to be aware of what color you're handing out if you have color-coded t-shirts like if, for the different crew there's certain <laughs> like listen to the local promoter rep listen to the crew chief like if they ask you not to use a color like do your homework like just please trust them on that because they're just certain it, it runs really deep like rivalries so like for example in in glasgow um we just really tried to avoid having them hand out blue, green, or orange t-shirts. And I won't really go into why, but they just, they symbolize like different um, sports teams that the, that the um, fans are very passionate about. I will leave it at that. Well, <laughs> so, and and it's a very cultural the, thing, you know, it's deep. The yeah. rivalries run deeper than just sports and go back to, you know, conflicts that are hundreds of years old. So um, mm -hmm. it, it is, I think, it, you know, in practical terms as a tour manager, it, you, if you're bringing over a band that have never been to the UK, there are some cities in the north of England and in Scotland and in Ireland, particularly where, you know, they may well very have, they, very, bleh, bleh, they may very well have the best show of their career and the crowds are amazing but there are some things to watch out for yeah. the the it's it's not an understatement to say to go into the wrong bar in glasgow wearing the wrong color shirt 
is going to get you punched in the face or a glass mm-hmm. over your head. It's just, you know, you just don't do that. Um, yeah. And at the same time, the, the, the pint throwing is you need to just prep your artist that that's not necessarily a we hate you get out of here. No, it, that's an endearing a, thing. I'm having a great fucking show. I'm just throwing my beer everywhere. So, so you know, yeah. <laughs> just not to take that yeah. the wrong way. But honestly, like, you know, the flip side of that is that the people I find that, the, you know, I have a strong affinity for, you know, the Northern English and the Scottish, like they're the best people, like they will have your back. You know, like so, you're in good hands. You know, trust well, in, them, trust your rep. And you're I'm in entirely good biased hands. there. And and Danny <laughs> mentions in the in the comments we make England sound so unruly. It's not that bad. It really is not. But just there's some small things you can yeah. do. You're not going to experience in other in other places. It, Certainly not in Japan with like like as Rob said. I think the thing yeah. is too is that there's some things about especially people that come from America. There's certain things about it that seem so American that you kind of relax. But then you, I think that as an American and as some as somebody who's like grown up cross culturally, for me, it's like I can say that like there are certain things like we're talking about the riffs that are tied to sports, but they're deeper than that. That just an American, no matter how deep a rivalry is here, you just can't understand the, the ramifications. I don't, I don't even know how to put it into words. So just like, it's, it's, yeah, it's a different country, but it's, but the people are great. And it's like, everybody has their thing, you know, it's in it, but it's, uh, yeah. You it's, noticed that Patty put in the chat about um, scheduling games, <laughs> the night of the night of the, the Manchester United versus Liverpool match <laughs> day, I guess. The Just Kara's so you know, like, Kara Kara and Doug Kara are Man U supporters, and right. I'm a Liverpool supporter. We don't I know. know. It's okay. We just rib each other world. a lot. And Kara had a, a visible <laughs> reaction to that statement. <laughs> and so did I. Well, well to bring it back right now, so it's it's you know. Not go there. To bring back to uh, more practical terms, Kara, how does that look? Let's say you're you're repping a show in Manchester, and you know City or United are playing. Do you have to factor anything into your thinking? Is there anything with the police or with security that you're thinking about? Um, the uh, uh, travel, parking, that sort of thing. Uh, not parking. Um, traffic is a problem. If you're at, it depends on the time. The times don't really clash that much. And if it did, it would be. It's more if you've got if you've got like a big gig at the stadium and we're doing a show at the Apollo or something like that, you know, that's not far right. away. It's, it doesn't, it's more, it's more travel. I think you can expect yeah. if there's a, if there's a, if there's a derby on and which is Manchester United versus Manchester city and we're playing it, they're playing it at, I don't know. Or if you've got like Arsenal have come up. And so there's like lots of people coming off the M6 off, off the highway and coming into town that can just, but we tend to know that generally beforehand from the, we keep in touch with the venue and, yeah. and keep on top of that. So those sorts of things, we just, and if we, we sometimes it happens not an awful lot. Okay. Yeah. And it's, it's sort of, I mean, that that's the sort of consideration you're thinking you have in the back of your mind anyway, you know, it can happen yeah. in the U S it can happen in mainland Europe as well with, with other, <laughs> other major events that are happening in your city. Um, yeah. I, I think it's, it, it, it tends to, be more it, for, for me it seems to be more of a, an issue in the UK and Europe because you know the cities are a bit older they, they don't have the same road network as, as North American cities do so you know how does that work you know talking about bus parking truck parking can that be a bit of a nightmare logistically when you've got city centre shows yes it can um, and it can be especially a big nightmare if it hasn't been advanced and we haven't got the license plates and the registration numbers of the of the vehicles. A lot of venues you can't park at at all. The smaller club venues, some of them you can, but we have to get council permits. So we have to have the the information. Otherwise, we can't get you a permit. And yeah, they may be able to park outside the venue. You may not. You, people might be parked there, and in which case that makes your loading that screws the loading immediately. Um, and then it's different over there, isn't it? You don't actually have to give the uh, the license plates. You just have to state the number of vehicles you have I think whereas yeah hey we need to know and if you're in a bigger even a bigger show as we were saying yesterday if you're in an arena and and you've got it's multi-trucks and they we can't fit them all under the arena or at the back or wherever we have to send them off to a parking area 
and they have to have the, per the the registrations as well to let them in, especially if they're coming in overnight and you've got some security man going now. You know, yeah. you need to you need to have that all in place, and that's done generally in the advance with the advance team at the office. If it hasn't been done, and I get to day one with you, and I'm like, I've got to park up seventeen trucks, and nobody's even, and everybody else is on the road at the moment, and there's somebody in, you know, Birmingham LG Arena, and there's somebody we're in the Birmingham Arena, and how am I going to fit them? And it's a Christmas market, and they've taken up half the parking that we normally go to, and you know, we need to have it in place. You can do as much as you can when you when you're actually on the road if it hasn't been advanced properly. But as all reps do, they try and do whatever they can. But mm -hmm. if you're stuck with a million trucks and having to talk to the truck drivers and the bus drivers day one, when really what you need to be doing is starting to get your relationships with the tour and not having to try and find little nooks and crannies to get these vehicles parked in. So yeah, please make sure you advance. Make sure you advance the the uh, parking. Stuff. yeah yeah you can't just rock up in the uk or europe and and you know we did touch upon we, we've touched upon visas and also you know bus driver hours in europe in our previous international panels but you know um bus buses in europe don't have generators like they do in north america so they cannot stay powered up in a parking lot um by the side of the road you know you you have a lot less flexibility in the uk and europe because of that so you know from your side, that's an extra thing you're having to deal with, Cara, right? You, you're having to, you've got tours coming in on days off that you might have to find parking and power for their buses, uh, mm -hmm. whether it be, you know, well, I'll let you speak to that. You know, how, how do you go about, uh, you know, finding space for, for tours that are incoming at maybe a day ahead of time? Well, you hope that they told you plenty of time. And then if it's not a busy... <laughs> If it's not a busy season, you start trying to pull favours from different venues going, can we put the bus here? Can we do this? Can we do that? Again, it has to be done in advance. On the days leading up to the show can be very difficult in October, you know, when it's mm -hmm. really the busy season. And just yeah. to drop say. in how, um, how much residents of those smaller streets do not appreciate a large idling double-decker entertainer coach mm -hmm. dropping folks at four or five in the morning. It's really, it's unpleasant. And the hotels or the venues always get complaints. So you can't, you know, you've, you've got to pull up and drop and run. And the, you know, the other challenge is how close can you get those buses to where they got to go? And yeah, you, yeah, for sure. Um, and, and, you know, just a quick point on, on that. I mean, even in some places, and that's coming in the US as well with, with LA, there are some places where idling is illegal. So um, your bus driver will, will be across that. Um, it's worth mentioning that your bus drivers in Europe sleep on the bus, so they will never leave the bus. So, you know, as a tour manager planning for a day off coming up, um, whereas in the US and Canada, you can just find yourself, let's, let's say you're on a one bus tour and you're not all sleeping in hotels on days off, you can just pull your bus into a Holiday Inn parking lot and and just have a shower room. That's not going to work in 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 Europe because you need shore power for your bus. So option one is moving on to the next city and calling up Cara in plenty of time and saying I need a spot for my bus uh, with power for my day off. Or option two is you drop your team at a hotel and your bus driver disappears off to a parking because he can stay with the bus. So you really need to be on your game when you're advancing with enough notice that like Cara said in busy periods they're going to have a spot for you hopefully or you're going to need to figure out an alternate solution um, yeah and like was mentioned yesterday as well was um the 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 you might think that it's a two-hour drive somewhere and it's um the roads aren't the same as over there, over there in the States. So you think like you could be five miles away from your venue staying in London and you've got to get across London and you're giving yourself half an hour to get there. It could take you up to two hours. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a good point. So and you definitely, def definitely want to talk to your drivers when you think you've routed something a certain way based on just what Kara uh, just said and Doug just said. Also, you know, you don't know, these are old, old, old countries with old, old construction and old streets, not super high tech bridges. So you may think you've got a straight shot somewhere and then suddenly there's a bridge that you don't know about 
that isn't indicated on a map that your bus can't get under. So I, my personal two cents on this one is I encourage you also not only to chat with your travel agents, but make sure that whoever your lead driver is on in your bus fleet knows what you think you're doing so that they can tell you where the challenges are going to be. They may also know which hotels you can't get close to, which hotels the bus can't even get near or get under. And these are things that you want to know in advance so that you don't have a logistical surprise party at five o'clock in the morning and everybody's mad because you know, they got to haul their their luggage three blocks down cobblestone streets in the middle of you know dark 30. Victorian England. Yep. Mark over to you. Yeah so um, so yesterday we had a conversation about relationships through the span of uh, the, the better you know better half of the year we've we've touched base on relationships in just about every single episode and that and that rings true uh whether you're domestic or you're international um mj and kara had discussed uh oh, let me let me look back now legendary the, incident legendary <laughs> incident situation <laughs> that came up in a show you did together a few years ago in manchester when kara was the rep and mj was the tm tell us first from each other your perspectives on what happened and uh, how you both dealt with it. I'm going to let Kara start because I, I want to hear her, her point of view first. Unless I mean, you really I, want me to start. I can't really remember how it happened. Okay. I, don't, I, so, I remember either the taking the call yeah. or getting the email. <laughs> I think it was a call, in fact. And I was just yeah. like... Because you were the rep and you were the, definitely right. We were sharing it. We were sharing it. So it was Manchester Albert Hall, which I kept thinking yeah. it was the Academy. It wasn't. It was Albert Hall, um, which is old and cold and... Uh, echoey and yeah um and um uh, and somebody said the lift breaks that's true and um so yeah we were sharing a production office everything was good and um i was traveling with this artist we had a pinball machine in a road case that i had designed um uh, because he wanted to take it out on tour and it was a thing like there was how he wound down at the end of the night um it was important to them it was like you know there wasn't really drinking going on on the tour there wasn't like it was like that's how they wound down you know and so this you know every so often we would have a venue where it was just really challenging to get it in and so we would try to stick it in like some back hallway or, or like a landing and there was just not a great spot for it here there just wasn't where there wouldn't be it would be kind of private where they could just wind down after the show and so I tried to talk, I tried to, on my end, like everything that I could think of to, you know, discuss with the production manager, like, where are we going to put it? And ended up talking to the artist about it, going, we might not be able to get it in there uh, into the dressing room. And, but there wasn't really anywhere else to put it. And finally, I just finally had to go to Kara and say, is there any way we can get this in the dressing room? And, um, and it was, uh, the case, like imagine a, a full size pinball machine and the case, so basically the legs had come off and the way it was designed is that the, the a top came off and there was a pinball machine that instead of having legs like sat on the perfectly angled sort of platform, right? And um, it was a beast and it was fine if you rolled it in, I mean, almost everywhere it would fit. We, and we, it was wide enough to go through doors usually, but not necessarily in an old place. It has to go up, it had to go up I think we were able to get it up in the lift to a certain point, but the last part to the dressing room, it had to go up 10 stairs. Yeah, no, there's no, there's no lift in the Albert Hall. It's just oh, these old, okay. it's old stone stairs. It's an old, I think it's an old church hall or something in the middle, yeah. it's on the first I floor. I was thinking there's a lift, okay, yeah. Um, and we couldn't get the turn on the stairs with it for some reason. Oh, that's I don't, right. I don't know why, because we, <laughs> I don't, I don't know, I can't remember why. And there was nowhere else to put it. It would literally block yeah. fire exits. Or mm -hmm. block. I mean, there was no way they could open the club if we had it stuck there. So yeah. they took the banister off. <laughs> and they did it. This is, yeah. but that's all about relationships. Going back to what we were mentioning before, it says it's, you have a good relationship with the venue and a good relationship with the tour manager. I mean, not anybody, if, I, if I, somebody just came up to me who I'd never met before and said, I need to get that, I'd be like, what? <laughs> but, you know, but you don't, but, as reps, we try and do what we can anyway. That's what we yeah. do. I mean, getting finding solutions to problems is, you know, one of the main yeah. jobs. So 
We and did the second see- ever venue back, the, the second ever show back at the Albert Hall after they reopened it and they had no heating in the house. So, you know, um, <laughs> There's never no, been any heating in there. No, it was. I remember it being really cold, and it, it didn't get crazy. warm until the people came in. I mean, it's and then all the, the instruments summer. changed because they had been tuned, and then when everybody came in, the tuning went off. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's cold. It's cold all year round. A lot of these buildings, they're old buildings. Something you had touched on yesterday, Doug. Um, you know, you might get on a plane from LA in your summer clothes, you know, and come over to here between October and April, and you could be freezing. It's minus seven at the moment here. Yeah. And, I- and, Those and venues are cold. MJ, I think it was you just made a great point there. Um, we're laughing about that because it's uncomfortable to sit in a cold production office. But that that you know you need to keep your team across that because it can affect instrument tuning. You know, mm. it's certainly going to affect your artists' happiness and perhaps their their well being. You know, yeah. so it's important that you you keep on top of that. Yeah, especially if you're on acoustics, which I learned. Especially like, in the bus probably isn't much warmer either so there's not going to be a lot of warm places to go so that's why you bring in yeah heaters if you can and make sure they have a warm place to go because that's something that make make everybody's day miserable to have a artist complaining about being cold because they're there's no place warm to go all day yeah the dressing rooms are usually all right in these venues but certainly if you're working on the floor in the house and or on the stage the loading doors are going to be open a long time for most of these load-ins and the way, the way some production managers do it um, and can be open for a lot and we're all everybody's cold I mean I get cold and I'm used to it so it's not it's not even in the summer <laughs> it can be cold so uh, before before we pass over to the gym to speak with Alice um, just a, you know a short takeaway from that is just communication is key always if there's some non-negotiables always make sure you're addressing that before the show in advance don't throw it on your promoter rep the day of and just you know add that wedge uh into the show day and last minute it's gonna be your best friend to to keep on track with those non-negotiables and be on the same page with your uh promoter rep going into the show y'all be that you, that's your best best friend in that scenario and keeping your relationship strong. Yeah. And stuff always route. happens at the last minute for me. Like I thought I had it ironed out that we weren't going to bring it in. And then it just became that it was just a non-negotiable, like it was really going to be a non-negotiable that day. But I also think that speaks to something we talked about yesterday was that we always talk about like, learn as much as you can work in as many positions as you can when you're coming up, because like I was able to understand from having been on Kara's side, like, um, what that was going to be like. And I didn't just walk in and go, we have to get this up the stairs. Like I tried every other angle on my side because I knew it was going to be a big dent in her day to make that happen. So I think that, but that came from my experience of having worked in that position. So I think that as we always talk about, like if you can work as you're coming up or shoot, I mean, a lot of us who tour do other stuff too, like work on festivals or work locally. It's like that will just help you to build better relationships when you do go into those touring situations because you have some empathy for what the other person is going through. Yeah. So. Well, Jim, we're going to pass it over to you. And, All right, and, Alice, uh, finally to you in Australia. Talk to us about oh. Australia <laughs> I, and what to expect. <laughs> Oh, I'm kind of glad now. Thanks. I've just been enlivened and woken up by uh, all of these wonderful tales. But um, look, I guess if we start with, um, yeah, if we start with the fact that, you know, you are a band that's going to be playing like 300 to 500 cap rooms in Australia, you've got a bit of buzz going on. I guess like I did want to say that um, first and foremost, because Australia is a really long way to come. (laughs) So, you know, Promoters um, are engaged very early on in this process and will sort of capture you for these first round of initial shows. And then they sort of stay with you, hopefully, and grow with you as you return to Australia time and time again. Um, And I guess, like, we were discussing yesterday that in in reality, even at a 300 to 500 cap sphere, there are sort of three main touring ways that happen when you travel around Australia and also around New Zealand as well. So you could either do a headline tour, which also encompasses at least one festival appearance. You do a festival tour uh, where there are some headline sideshows and generally they would be at a reduced capacity 
to sort of drive the festival being your pinnacle appearance and then you'd do some smaller headline sideshows and then or you would just do a flat out headline tour with shows only and I think those three elements are pretty consistent with what happens uh you know with your first round of touring in Australia so similar to sort of you know Rob and Cara promoters are really engaged early on like I mentioned and it is all about building a relationship and I think interestingly enough the promoters sort of engage you they do a deal with your agent or your manager whichever state you're at, you know whichever situation you have and then you do sort of an agreed to a budget now the reason I mention this is that the promoter uh, whether they have an advanced team similar to like what Cara was mentioning uh, a lot of the promoter teams in Australia operate quite differently. They either have an in-house advance team and then hand it over to someone like me who meets you at the airport and really only gets handed the tour sort of two days beforehand, or they've got someone who handles the advance um, the whole way through and then they come on the road. Of course, if we're talking, you know, stadium and arena bands, it's slightly different, but I think let's stick with the club sort of run through for now because it's a pretty good snapshot. So, um, you know, when you're working with the promoter, they're looking after all of the things like your immigration for your entry into Australia. Um, and I wanted to flag something that I brought up yesterday because time and time again, even when I was, you know, working on the festival routing, there were a lot of bands that didn't realise that, um, you know, even when you're talking about the movement into either Australia uh, and New Zealand, that they're actually two completely different countries and they're classified as an international movement. Now, when it comes to, <laughs> when it comes to your freight um, and your flights and the inclusions in your deal, that's actually a really valid point um, to always keep in mind because quite often the promoter deals won't encompass your, won't encompass your international fares. And so when you are booking your, your tickets in and out of your primary area, it's that leg and that movement is generally the artist's responsibility. So, you know, I know that that has, um, that's something that sometimes catches a few bands by surprise. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a good little useful tip. Of course, at the higher level, um, you know, it, it's slightly different because you might be, you know, meeting Rob afterwards in Japan or whatever. But I think, yeah, for the Australian and New Zealand movement, that's a, that's a good little tip. So when you arrive in Australia, um, you're kind of looking at doing perhaps four to six cities and you're being here up to sort of a maximum of 10 days you will hit the key markets so the key markets being your Melbourne your Sydney your Brisbane on sort of the Thursday Friday Saturday and then the smaller markets on the other days that is sort of fleshed out by promo and whatever else you have going on but quite often you will fly in from overseas and you'll start or finish in Perth now a lot of people don't realize Australia is completely fly only. <laughs> um, we are fly only because we are a massive country and it is a four hour flight. Uh, it is a four hour flight from Sydney to Perth. Um, and I think, you know, that distance and that time difference itself, um, you know, does, <laughs> does get people at times. So you well, kind of get. Too. There's nothing in between them. That's the thing to do is it's not like, like in the U S where you have tertiary markets somewhere there's nothing in between those well, there is but it's a desert right yeah. there's nothing you're right you <laughs> can't get anywhere from <laughs> her <laughs> can't grow. if i if i can make a tip in australia always request the window seat because the uh the scenery when you're flying across australia on all of your fly dates is really impressive so <laughs> i always suggest that you do that um and uh yeah so i guess the fly touring element of it is a is a massive thing because you know even in the UK Europe um, you know the modes of transport in Japan are different and it, uh, definitely in America you're doing bus touring in Australia that's just not the case so you just really have to love airports and you have to be comfortable with flying um, you, you know and that's where someone like me who comes on and on the road we know these airports we know the movements in and out and I guess you know someone like me who comes on as a promoter rep TM, um, I get positioned with a whole bunch of different bands pending on what sort of, you know, the, the promoter and the agent think that band needs. So, you know, I will generally, I look after a lot of rock, indie, uh, yeah, I do, I do a fair bit of hip hop and electronic artists. And that's sort of, you know, that sounds quite 
um, you know, diverse in itself, but there are a whole bunch of us that work across sort of different genres and that that relationship itself going back to, you know, Cara and Mary, what you were saying before, like it's really um, that relationship and, and understanding the needs of the tour, those conversations start very early. Um, and so, you know, I think, yeah, just going back to when the bands look to arrive in Australia, essentially I get handed the tour almost only two days before. <laughs> so it's sort of a, it really is a crash course in understanding what the band wants, what the routing is, triple checking, you know, ground transport, production, backline, hotels, air travel, and also making sure that you engage with the artists um, in some pre-conversations. And I think in, a, in Australia, because, you know, a lot of people just want to come to Australia and have a good time, <laughs> um, you know, how can I make that happen? <laughs> Um, that's kind of my, you know, that's a big ethos of mine. I was like, you know, coming to Australia generally for a lot of people is a really fun and novel thing. So, you know, having those conversations in the first couple of days before you arrive in Australia and finding out the nuances and the niches of the artists coming in um, is really important. So, you know, just to, I guess that's a lot of overarching information, but I guess um, a couple of things I did want to mention is the jet lag. <laughs> The jet lag can be really brutal. Um, and for a lot of people coming in from, particularly if you're coming direct from the UK, Europe or America, your flights coming into Australia more often than not um, will land early morning. So, yeah, your flight's landing early morning and then having that first day of recovery, um, I'm all about engaging people's tips as how to do that. But, you know, I guess trying to keep people... <laughs> Um, you know, trying to keep people awake and engaged after, you know, 20, 24 to 27 hours transit. So I would love to say that like Japan, we come and have a meeting straight away. But the reality is, is that people are ruined and they would much rather go to Bondi Beach and have a swim and grab a massage and then pass out. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think uh, those early conversations upon landing, for me, it's more just about making people comfortable getting them actually into the country on that first day and then it's sort of business from the second day which generally will start with press promo and a show and then from there on it's literally you know you start the day you go and load in you do do the show you pack down you load out you go to the hotel you have an early morning flight to get to the next city and it sort of repeats from there so it's quite a consistent and it can be pretty brutal at times, particularly as you get bigger and the production crews have to fly earlier and earlier. Um, so, yeah, and I guess, um, yeah, so does that give you a good rundown, Jim? Do you want me to cover anything? Yeah. <laughs> um, one of the things to mention, I don't think we came up this, is some of our students might realize that winter and summer are flipped in Australia. So um, we're usually like right now it's actually warm. And so a lot of people forget they, they're going over there and they, they, you know, think, oh, it's winter in the States and they bundle up and bring all their winter clothes and they get there and it's a hundred degrees and it's middle of summer. So to realizing that you're dealing with a different world and also too that how important that relationship is between the team. And, and, and I think a little bit even with Rob in Japan and, and actually even in some places in Europe too, where you're dealing with a promoter rep who's running things, running the tour for you or with you and how much you got to kind of have to give that to them a little bit and work with them because they'll, it'll save your life because they know what you're walking into. They know the venues, they know the culture. And it's really important that you trust them and work well with them and, and not try to be, a. it's not a place to be a micromanager or to be a control freak. Absolutely. And I think, you know, you've just become, uh, you know, as, as a promoter, I'm always trying to think of ways when artists arrive in Australia, what, I, what we can do to help. And I know that we sort of all function in, in many ways like this, but obviously instruments, when you're traveling with them, they've undergone a huge amount of travel. So on that first day, when people, you know, particularly the artists and the touring group might be a little bit knackered, you know, giving me instruments, giving me things to go and buy at the, um, you know, at the, at the music store, you know, any anything that they may need over the coming days, double checking that their rider is is still the same and sort of having a few of those interim quick conversations within that first day to sort of get the big ticker items underway, I think is, you know, I've, it's definitely served me well in the past. And I think having that relationship and, 
with the bands and just letting them entrust many things in you to sort of run it on ground, given that, you know, we, we are there to make your time a lot easier and to sort of be that then key liaison back to the, back to the promoter with all of the operational elements of the tour, I think, um, mm. you know, just, just bades well for, for a really successful run. Before we get to five, one, Doug, did you have a question? Yeah, Alice, um, the the touring. I mean, you, you know, you, you've toured extensively in Australia, but you've also toured over here uh, in North America and Europe as well. The, the the touring festival, like Laneways, is quite a uniquely Australian thing. I mean, obviously we have them elsewhere, but with the flying involved, um, I'm I'm interested both, uh, you know, with your experience as a tour manager and also in artist liaison. Are there any unique challenges that that throws up in terms of the fact that you have many artists mm-hmm. groups flying on the same flights, looking for the same hotels. Do you ever run into issues with like flight availabilities or things like that? Well, I guess, uh, interestingly, when the festival was happening in Singapore and, and it sort of stopped having that leg there a couple of years ago, but, you know, we did face a couple of international flight challenges where <laughs> there was one. So we had the festival in Singapore on the Saturday uh, we had this yeah, festival in Singapore on the Saturday and then we would have one commercial flight, one commercial flight that would get us from Singapore <laughs> to New Zealand in time for show day. Now, if with that intricacy in mind, it was wild because I had to book uh, that flight, always booked out. It was with Air New Zealand and it booked out months and months in advance. So I essentially had to hold 150 seats across a cross section of business class, premium and economy based on a rough number <laughs> that I would anticipate without the lineup even being booked. <laughs> so it was it was pretty wild that that would happen. And then, of course, you know, coming straight off the festival date, going into an international flight at 5 a.m. and you've got 120 people and all of their fly luggage trying to get onto that plane. I mean, it was the funniest sight I've got probably I've got the funniest pictures and funniest memories of just people rolling on road cases <laughs> through Singapore airport where the only people there <laughs> I think we scared them to be honest but um, that must have been carnage <laughs> oh look it's like and, the airport equivalent of like everybody posting up in the lobby of a hotel oh, pretty much right? yeah absolutely and you know you kind of got a really good feel for who was traveling with what because I guess Singapore in that instance was the first international stop. So, you you know, people, artists were flying in on different days, depending what they needed their recovery time to be. Um, And then similarly sort of with flights out of New Zealand and then throughout Australia, I guess the domestic legs, not so much because I guess based on when the artists were performing, there was, you know, pre-COVID, there was a pretty broad cross-section of flight times. Um, But, you know, we would suggest very intrinsically that, that, um, you know, I, as an artist liaison at that point, I was really trying to capture when people were flying and when the pressure points would be on the lineup, you know, pending what type of aircraft it would be, how much courage there is, you know, whether I think we need to encourage people to get to the airport early because there's going to be a lot of check-in delays. And of course, as everything turns, I guess that's the risk in Australia now, everything is turning away from that customer service element at airports and everything is self-automated. So, you know, fly touring, you just actually have to allow for a little bit more time. And one thing that a lot of people might not know is that for the two major airlines in Australia, Qantas and Virgin, there's a really, the benefit of having someone like me and using a local travel agent through the promoter for these domestic legs is that there's actually a really incredible musician's baggage allowance. Now that, yeah, so for both crew and tour party, you can actually tap into this, uh, yeah, tap into this deal where there's, you get, regardless of your status, you get three checked pieces included. You have to register ahead of time, but three checked pieces up, yeah, usually three pieces at 23 kilos that can go up to the commercial fly weight of 32 kilos. And for a lot of bands, you know, that captures a whole bunch of, uh, you know, instruments and luggage requirements. So you don't actually have to fork out for a whole bunch of domestic freight, which is, in those early days, every cent counts. And that's a huge win for, you know, what what the lobbying bodies did a few years ago to get that over the line. Great. 
Hey, Alice, a quick question from one of our viewers, Paul. He wanted to ask if people want to stay on for a vacation at the end of the tour. Uh, how, do yeah. you, how do you address that with visas and accommodations? Well, oh, well basically, uh, that was a point I was going to bring up, actually. Awesome. Uh, yeah, so I guess the novelty of coming all the way to Australia is that I absolutely encourage you to stay. <laughs> you know, if you can and you do want to take a holiday, absolutely. There's a one flat fee for your performance visa coming in, right? So all you need to do is we can amend the dates, of course, but if you know that you want to stay on at the end, at the at the time of negotiating the deal and coming on board and um, in whatever capacity, whether you're crew or whether you're a party, you just have to tell whoever is handling your immigration to just ensure that the end date that you're leaving, um, yeah, is, is reflective of how long you're staying in Australia. So... Um, and then just have your outbound flights to match and that's it. So, yeah, I think, um, you know, when it comes to hotels and, and that basically from the point of the end of the tour, if I have my promoter rep hat on, the onus is then on that person to organise what, whatever they want, wherever they go. Um, and, you know, I can certainly assist with making recommendations or, you know, onward planning or, or whatever, but ultimately that sort of ends up as that person's responsibility. Right. And definitely folks need to make it to the Lone Pine Koala Sanctuary while they're while they're in Oz. It's just well, I guess. Oh, yeah, because I saw the, um, you know, when you do come to Australia, I guess. Yeah. The, those elements of the Australian culture that you just really want to see, which includes, you know, our native wildlife, our beaches. I think, you know, a couple of times I've, um, you know, especially touring Australia in the summer, which is the Northern's winter, you know, make the most of being outdoors and, and seeing the sunshine um, and on the proviso that you've adjusted <laughs> and yeah. you're not dying. <laughs> there's, there's, um, some, there's some really, even if you're just there for 10 days and you have a moment, if you take the opportunity to bust a little bit of a move, I don't think I ever smiled as big as I did the day that I finally got to have a, a hold a koala. Oh. I think my face almost cracked right off from the grin. <laughs> oh, it's yeah. so beautiful. And I yeah. think, you know, like I, um, you know, a couple of times I've even, you know, I've taken, I've found a couple of yoga instructors and I've gone to the botanic gardens and the whole, I've taken the whole tour party and we've done it, uh, a yoga in the botanic gardens and, you know, just being surrounded by, um, you know, I guess beautiful nature, intrinsically Australian you know, it's also calming. It's good for people's health, body, mind, especially if they're not used to, yeah. um, you know, the fly touring nature of Australia. I'm, I guess, you know, personally, I have a really big investment in making sure that people have healthy living and healthy attributes on the road and, you know, wherever, wherever possible and trying to include them wherever I can every couple of days um, just to ensure that people are seeing some fresh air and just not breathing in club air 24-7. <laughs> But, and yeah, I just want to make one comment before I throw it back to 5-1 and that, you know, ex having these magical experiences with your teammates, it create, it's just so worth it to take as much uh, advantage of your opportunity to be in these places as you can with the people that you're working with. It really does wonders for building, you know, building your team um, bond and also take advantage of the opportunities that we have in this business. Over to you, my friend. Thank you, Miss A.B. So, Rob, I know that you bring, help bring, through your company, help bring Japanese artists over to North America. And Alice, I know that you've t TM'd some groups coming from Australia over here to yeah. the States. So, First question, it's two-part question. First one, I'll go to Rob and then I'll come to you, Alice. So Rob, can you tell us uh, some of the differences for Japanese artists when they're touring the States? Sure. Um, Their expectations. Right. The, 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 it's, it's really kind of difficult to understand unless you've actually toured Japan to understand the differences. But when you show up at a venue in Japan, you're greeted by three or four helpers, you you come across a line of microphone stands that are perfectly in line. You come across a, a, a pile of uh, mic cables that are perfectly coiled and ready to go. And people are waiting and are ready to work and they're going. And you come to America and you go to load in and you're lucky if the lights are on 
and there's no heat on, there's no anything, you know, they're all coming in the door at the same time you are. So uh, Japanese bands have a lot of anxiety touring places they've never toured before. Um, because they've toured every single venue in Japan many times. They know exactly where everything is in that venue, and it's, it's fine. So when they come to the States for the first time, they really want to have as much information as they possibly can. And they will ask someone like me just thousands of questions on, on you know, down to what color are the tires on the truck, and like stuff like that. Um, you know, Americans want... What do I need to do to get the show done? What do I need to make this show happen? And Japanese are like, what do I need? What can you give me that will make this show happen? And the Japanese, they want a menu of what you have and they want it to be accurate so that they can choose what the options are and then implement that. Whereas Americans are like, I don't know, you got any string, duct tape, let's go. And <laughs> it's, just, it's, it's, it's just a different culture because the Japanese crew like the American crews are, are just responsible to the artists and they want to give the artists the best possible experience they can possibly have on stage. And to do that, they want to know as many options as they have to make it happen. So it's a lot more advancing. It's a lot more calling up and asking the truck company, what color the tires are and stuff like that. And you're going to be wrong They're You're going to, show up with black microphone stands and they told you they were chrome it's just going to happen so okay and what about you alice uh, um well i just wanted to share actually a bit of a uh, quick story so i mean i have toured a lot um in australia and kind of really only been doing it for about eight years but two years ago i applied so I started to work with bands that began touring overseas and I thought, well, you know, TM, TM hat on. I was like, I can't TM a band and go to America if I haven't been there before myself. So I actually applied for my state government back home. Um, it's quite incredible. And I actually was like, well, I've got to try, try before you buy. <laughs> so I applied for a fellowship program and basically... I went and, uh, yeah, I went and toured America and South America myself, uh, deemed by my friends, Alice's Spring Break. <laughs> and just, I basically went to as many festivals, venues, and jumped on a whole bunch of tours. Thankfully, like due to the relationships I'd built as an artist liaison, I'd reached out to a whole bunch of artists that I'd noticed were doing similar touring routes around America. And I was actually able then to go and meet these venue reps tour around America I ended up doing like 55 shows or something you know and the pinnacle festivals like Coachella New Orleans um yeah like yeah New Orleans uh, Jazz Fest and anything sort of in between that sphere and then I ended up sort of meeting everyone and seeing the differences firsthand before I went there <laughs> and I'm forever grateful that like my government back home actually um, yeah, was actually allowed, you know, has programs that facilitate learning like this because it, quite honestly, they, they covered my air travel and a bunch of expenses on the ground and it just set me up running into a venue, you know, with and running into the tour with King, King Gizzard and Lizard Wizard who weren't necessarily playing like small shows. They were going, they were doing the Greeks and a few, you know, they were doing greek size venues a lot of places. So it was really quite an incredible experience to sort of be that face on the ground and, and be the Aussie and understand the lingo. Because I think as a big thing, not only is the obvious one of being going from fly touring to bus touring, you're just going in America. A lot of the venues that I have had experiences with, just you, there are a lot of people in the team that you talk to. So unlike Australia where, you know, you're kind of dealing with one one rep in America, my experience was that there were just so many people within the advance of a show that you detail because it's just broken up into such fixed departments. So, yeah, I guess um, that for me was was a big thing that was like, whoa, you know, that was the big difference coming from coming from Australia into into the United States. And I guess just yeah, the big thing was lingo. Like it was it was quite hysterical <laughs> I mean one they think I'm from England always never Australia <laughs> um but look I guess uh you know just understanding that 
Uh, you know, the music stores are slightly different. The bus touring lifestyle is just something to be learned. And I think with, with some bands that aren't used to it, my experience with that is that sometimes that can just take a bit of time and understanding, um, you know, doing tips and quirks on the road to just make that life a lot easier. So, for example, with King Gears, I would, you know, park buses up and always in the morning I'd get up and go and get scooters and then put scooters outside the bus so people had modes of transport in the morning when they woke up or, you know, doing a, a um, I went and bought juices for the bus and a few bits and pieces to just make the healthy living that's a little bit tougher across America because you're coming from Australia where, you know, fresh fruit and veg and everything like that is just, you know, we're very sport for choice over here and then people who have that, that are very conscious and that's part of their inherent who they are as a as a person music and band aside it's actually um yeah having a few elements like that was a big change but uh you know i guess just the sheer size of america the sheer size of america the change in lingo dealing with so many more different departments in a similar size you know venue advance process they were they were the biggest changes yeah, and I, I just wanted to chime in on that. You know, my first time visiting the US was on tour, so it was like being dropped in at the deep end. Um, you know, culturally coming from Europe to go or Australia going to the US, it's pretty straightforward. We've all, you know, the US is the most represented culture in the world in media. But, you know, a couple of little things that jump out to me, you know, the US is the size of a continent, so it changes drastically. New York City is very different to Iowa, for example. But, you know, just be careful treading in conversation when you're talking about politics, religion, guns, yeah. um, anything like that, because Australians and especially people from the United Kingdom can be quite mouthy and can, you know, speak without knowing their surroundings. And you might think you're in a in in what you would consider a, a space safe space to talk about those things. Just be careful because you might be offending people. That's just a broad strokes cultural thing to be aware of but you know yeah. um aside from that if you have a funny accent speak slow and be prepared to be bought lots of drinks in the bar because people will love you uh, and <laughs> also and this specifically goes for australians and british is that certain words that are completely benign in both cultures are like the worst words you can say in the US. So <laughs> brush up on your slang and what is good or not. <laughs> yep. Uh, I have one last question for Rob before I throw it over to Doug. And it was a question that we had from Paul. Um, he says, Rob, can you give a good strategy for dealing with conflict in a culture that hates to lose face? Ooh, that's a tough question. Um, I don't have a good strategy. I can tell you that you have to be respectful and you have to um, give them uh, an honorable way out. And, uh, but you must you know, keep your position if your position is reasonable. Um, it is about the long-term relationship you're expecting to have with this person and the next time you come to that country. So respect, give them an option that, that is a way that you can both win is the easiest way to deal with that conflict. I'm just going to pop in and say that my first, before, just before you would close us out, my first dealings with Rob years and years and years ago, we had a very um, interesting artist that I was with and it took us three weeks to close out the settlement of, of that run because of some interesting things that took place. And do you remember, you remember Rob? how uh, interesting I, I'm not going to say it out loud was it the one where the mother was calling you yeah yep 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 yep, <laughs> yep, yep. and mm -hmm. and and my artist wasn't interested in the way that the Japanese culture ran so we ran around and and all I can say is that you have if you have a conflict with the Japanese be patient listen to each other and and do the best you can to let them know that you are trying to that you understand that we do things differently than they do and that you're trying to bridge that gap it can be a little bit testy but mm. ultimately with patience and good communication skills conflicts can be resolved it may take a minute 
but yeah. yes. Yeah. Yes. Rob and I are li living proof of, of that for sure. We've had some interesting scenarios through our time doing shows together. And I can say that if you're just patient and you try and talk to your folks and, and, and you put out a gracious gesture, that goes a long way in conflict resolution. That, that tour that you're referring to is definitely a very challenging, challenging <laughs> tour for the books. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, to, to start wrapping things up, let, this is, goes to all three of our guests. Um, are there any things that are really hard to provide or organize for a band coming into your country that you might, they might be used to in, having in North America? All three of you can answer that. This. Uh, my, my most difficult writer problem is oxygen. Um, it is something that needs a prescription and is not something that I can just walk into a medical supply place like you could in the U.S. and, and get. Um, other things like um, ibuprofen is a prescription. So, you know, people with headaches. Uh, uh, Japanese medicine is in Japanese and it's the label. So Western people are kind of intimidated by it. So my guess is if you've got a big enough tour, you're probably got a road case with some sort of medical drawer in it, but you've got all those things in it. But if you're a club band and you've got a someone with a seafood allergy, you should probably be carrying Benadryl everywhere you go. So, right. Alice, Kara, anything to add to that? I think we both have the same one, don't we? Throat coat is definitely, throat coat tea is definitely a no-no over here now. And I believe Alice has the same issue in, in Australia. <clears throat> so there's some weird tequilas you can get in the states that are very difficult to get here if we've got plenty of time we can always try and get it from our old friend amazon um but quite a lot aren't available on there either so it's good to check before you or the american store which is always a good place to find those items that you can't find yeah yeah in the states. yeah I think, exactly yeah just with um just on that and i mean it's been covered a whole bunch of times in in your sessions before but this is why it's just really important as the TM to find time prior to the tour to review the rider and go through and see if there are any substitutions that need to be made because you can't get it locally. And if it's an absolute deal breaker, like, you know, something that MJ had previously, um, you know, or, or whatever, it just gives you the time. Um, and I think it's just all about that preparedness of just having that time to be able to, find it or find the nuance, um, you know, find an alternative or find a friend overseas who can post it to you in time. Um, but also, you know, I guess one thing I wanted to mention is that for Americans, especially, I'm sorry that I didn't mention it earlier, but, you know, the, the simple power difference in the voltage from going from America to Australia and the importance of transformers and, and that. So, yeah, the voltage is actually different between Australia and America. <laughs> um, so, and even just appliances like hair dryers or hair straighteners. And I know it seems, you know, quite simple, but the amount of blown hair dryers and things that we've had because they've just gone in without realizing uh, is is quite a lot. <laughs> and especially when you're touring with a hair and makeup team and 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 whatever, it's really important that on the hair and makeup writer that they're actually included. Yeah. I'm going to say something really quick about Japan, though. Rob, is it still true that the um, electrical is not grounded? Oh, well, uh, modern or maybe buildings, the newer places are. Yeah, yeah. the newer places are, are grounded. Um, it's actually that's it. Power is a three part issue because, yeah, you definitely have a grounding issue. But in in Western Japan, it's at 60 cycles and Eastern Japan's at 50 cycles. So if you've got electronic gear, it's sharp. Uh, so you need a cycle generator and those things always break. Um, and it's hundred volt, not 110, which unless you've got something like an old Hammond B3, it shouldn't make a difference, but your clothing dryers are going to take forever to, to get hot enough to do that. Um, Japanese bands touring America will blow everything just like Alice because the, the, it's only one, you think 10 volts is going to make a difference, but it, it does. And so I'm carrying around transformers every time I tour the U.S. too. 
Um, what about rock docs? Is it hard to organize? They say a singer gets sick and, and needs a doctor ASAP. How difficult is that to, to call up rock doctors in your areas? I don't have that option. I, I, get, I did <laughs> want to find a Russian doctor that <laughs> took care of me. I still don't know how it happened, to be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> so I, can get, I can get you a doctor but i can't get you something that's going to get you vicodin so yeah. <laughs> um yeah rock doctors in this and there's a few operating around australia that we can we can get to your hotel and act in complete confidentiality 24 7 yeah, yeah we have a couple couple over here as well that ones that we know and trust so yeah um, rock docs for anyone who doesn't know they're they're freelance medical professionals who will come out to your venue or hotel um your your best bet to source one is is your promoter rep so if if you're coming in to do an sjm show give Kara a shout if you need somebody and they tend to have some like at least one or two numbers on file that they can throw your way um and and the same goes for voltage in europe 240 volts in europe um so you will when you're renting backline um you know, and you're coming from the US, your backline supplier will be able to sort you out with transformers or, you know, uh, if you're carrying a bigger package, you know, it's going to be dealt with by your production team, but just to bear that in mind when you go to Europe. Um, in closing, can each one of you give us a tip of uh, that you'd give for a band coming to tour in your country? Uh -huh. <laughs> I would Enjoy. say have. <laughs> I would say, um, I would say honestly, have fun, because Australia is a really fun, uh, yeah, a really fun place to come to be around, and you know, we want Australia to be a good memory to go home with. I want to say something super fast to that, and it goes back to what Alice said before. If you trust in your local team, there, you as a tour manager just become like an entertainment guy like you just become like it is so fun for tour managers it's a it's a tour manager's golf vacation to go yeah. to that was my first so much you, can, you have to be more focused but australia yeah. is just a party like yeah. not a party like you know it's just relaxing it's like you got your tour manager you get to be tour managed as yeah. the tour manager and you become a social director super interesting <laughs> and that's that's kind of the way in japan as well as australia where they have so much support that, that as a tour manager you're actually tour you managed and that might be a little bit anxiety producing but if you back into it and you're just okay and you go with the flow the experience is really something that you come to look forward to and you have the opportunity. It's just so much more enriching when you let go and be a part of the process. Don't yeah. fight it. Just go and with it. Did anyone mention also, a shoey? <laughs> did anyone mention a shoey? It's a walk of passage. Look, it's 6 a.m. here. I can't be talking <laughs> shoey. <laughs> and also, I'm just going to say that if you're in Osaka, we have a friend. We have a an industry friend at the Rock Rock Bar called Yoko. Yeah. And she's almost she's almost the ambassador to japan for the entertainment industry and we all know her and love her and she pops up and becomes your fun time ambassador for the city of osaka and you go by and you go see her and she's just lovely for sure um, I, I was just gonna sorry to jump in cara i was just gonna say um yeah like as a literally i just love having a good time and really genuinely love traveling like in my own time away from work so I was telling the panel yesterday that I have started creating city hit lists um which are like yeah so they're google maps lists of just all the fun things that you can do in a city so as a local tm when bands arrive and they're like hey I want to find you know somewhere nearby there's a google maps list that I can just send them and they can pick and choose and I've written little reviews or what's really good or opening times or little quirks and I've found that people then come back and they also add, um, yeah, they also add a, uh, you know, because crew and people who have toured to Australia, especially international, you guys are like a web of information also. <laughs> you know, you have you have great tips that not even me as a local has heard of. So it works reciprocal. It's both ways. Rob and Kara, do you have something to add to advice for bands coming, coming to you? Well, pretty much what everyone's been saying, just enjoy it and 
embrace the UK when you come here. It's a lot of historical, a lot of culture, a lot of art, really good art galleries, lots of it. Get yourselves out. Don't be just sat in a, you know, if you've got a day off, don't just sit in the hotel room. If you've got some energy, use it if you can use it and and, and learn about the the culture of, a, of, of England, Scotland, while we're still there. Read it, um, right. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I would <laughs> I would love to see Japan again from a first time person's eyes. I've been going to Japan for so long that that you know I, I don't appreciate it as much as that first where am I? <laughs> it's my it's my it. one of my top three places in the world. Um the last time I was over there with with Rob, I stayed for a week. I spent Thanksgiving there um and I really was able to immerse myself in the culture as I wanted to and just wander and take the time. And I can't say enough about all the places that, that are represented today on the panel are just, mm -hmm. I miss the world y'all. I can't wait to get back to it. <laughs> oh, we all, yeah. yeah. Definitely my favorite places to tour. For yep. sure. Oh, I have, I just, uh, I can't wait, Rob. I've never been to Japan. It's the one place I've never been. I know it's oh. shocking. It's oh. a disaster. So you're on my speed dial. And you know what? Yeah, Quickly please, about I, I, I would love for you to, to be there when I'm there and, and find a way. I, I actually went to high school in Sydney. So oh. I've, I've spent a lot of time in Australia, but I'd love to, I haven't been in so many years. I'd love to go back. I wanted to say something really quick about, to add into what Kara said about, um, about the, um, history and stuff like almost all the museums and everything are free in the UK it's like a lot of countries you have to pay to get into museums and things like that but UK you can just major major stuff you can just walk right in and and, and honestly like going to see the castles and stuff are really not that expensive either and the British Museum is one of my like all-time favorites for mm. sure I do miss that museum mm. I'm a fan of the Tate <laughs> I spent all day in there yeah, yeah. <laughs> In every tape. Right, well, wrap, I'd like to thank our guests, Rob, Alice, Kara, for joining us today. Thank you. This thank you. Informative and and I believe um, we're having a a little session at at um, Clubhouse if people want to join us. I guess so. Um, thanks. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Next week, yeah. uh, before before we close, next week is. A bat, we are back to an, on the spotlight on. We're going to be talking with audio engineers, sound, that entire world. As always, you can, uh, you'll can you see all our updates across our socials. And please make sure to follow our YouTube channel, like, subscribe. And uh, we'll see you next Monday, same time. Yay.